Join us for a journey as we go back to the great civilizations of the past. Who were the people? What were they like? How did they begin and how did they end? Let's find out on episode 46, the first Olympic Games, 776 BC. Previously on the Fan of History, Greece slowly emerged from the Dark Age. Sparta was founded, and the most powerful city in Greece, Passat cities in Greece, were Chalice and Lefkandi. Old, um, I'm going to need help on this word, Eritrea. Right? Eritrea. Eritrea. Dang it, I missed it. I was looking right at it. On the island of Euboea. <laughs> Yeah, something like that. Something similar. All right. Well, Dan, what is going on? And I guess this is pretty poetic since the Olympics in Rio de Janeiro just ended. Yeah, they did. And uh, the Olympic Games were revived in 1896. Uh, but uh, they went on for a thousand years in the ancient past. And this year, 776 BC, was the beginning of the Olympics. And it seems to be a a fairly good date. It seems to have really been 776 BC. There are no other suggestions for a year for this. Uh, In the larger world around the Mediterranean and Near East, uh, the most important state is Urartu at this time, led by King Argishti. So we have to mention him. Right. And, but we'll talk very little about Assyria and about Urartu in this episode because we'll talk all about archaic Greece and this sporting event. So if Chal- Chalkis, Chalcis, I don't actually know the English pronunciation <laughs> of the town, but if that is the most powerful city-state in Greece, it is in Urartu, it would just be a small country town pretty much. Mm-hmm. So the, the power difference between these great states, uh, Syria and Urartu, and Greece is enormous at this time. Greece is not anything like ancient Greece. This is archaic Greece. There, these places are towns or villages. So don't think about like giant Athens or something because that doesn't exist yet. Gotcha. So, uh, but before we go to the Olympics, we have to talk about a few more city-states that will become important. We have mentioned Athens and Sparta and these places on the UB island, but we need to talk about Corinth. Corinth. We Corinth. mentioned Corinth before. I don't think we have. We have uh, only that perhaps that it was powerful. Okay, I think that must have been it. It's extremely hard to date anything then. The Greeks will soon begin to read and write again, but they will not read and write history uh, for a long time. We know because of archaeology that there is a cult to Hera Acrea established north of Corinth. Hmm. Corinth is very strategically located uh, on the, if you look at the Greek map, you see Corinth has access to both the ocean in the west and the ocean in the east, or will have that access. So there's an isthmus at Corinth, which makes the location of the city extremely good. But in 800 BC, we can find stuff that looks like Corinth uh, in archaeology. And we know that the Corinthians themselves claim that kingship was either abandoned or modified in 780 BC. We know there is an early war between Corinth and another city-state called Megara at about this time. Uh, We also know that pottery spreads from Corinth into the Gulf of Corinth at this time. And that includes the site named Delphi. Ooh, where the oracle was? Yes, very famous for the oracle at Delphi. And we will dedicate a whole episode to the oracle. And it seems that the oracle appears right about this time or somewhat later. So the episode will come later than the Olympics, but it's around this time. And the first proof that there is an oracle at Delphi will will appear in Corinthian pottery. 
And as I said before, when we get to the Oracle at Delphi, I will try to prove that it was the greatest scam perhaps <laughs> of all time, but definitely the greatest scam of archaic Greece. That's amazing. What's funny is every time you say Corinthian, I cannot help but think of Ricardo Montalban, because here in the United States, we had a series of commercials where he was talking about a vehicle. Um, I can't remember what it was. I know people will be screaming at me. It was the blankety blank vehicle. Anyway, it was a nice high, you know, high dollar expensive vehicle, but he kept talking about, he said, and this vehicle has rich Corinthian leather. Which okay. it meant nothing, but every time, like people still today, when they talk, when they say anything is nice, we say, "But does it have Corinthian leather?" You know, just stuff like that. So every every time, forever, Corinth and Corinthian will be forever associated with Ricardo Montalban. I can't help but <laughs> okay. read it that way in my head. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> sweet. <laughs> uh, we do perhaps have to mention Athens as it will be the most important place in ancient Greece. Uh, Athens somehow survived the Dark Age. We talked about this before. It was reduced to tiny village. And when I say tiny, I mean tiny was really, really small. Perhaps down to like 500 people. Wow. But... At this time, Athens is coming back. There are fresh cemeteries built at the beginning of this century, then the 8th century BC. But Athenian pottery has no influence over the rest of Greece. So they, they make a specific style of Athenian pottery, and it's not spreading into Greece. And it seems that Athens is more oriented towards the islands and the Aegean Sea than towards Greece. And it's been like that since the beginning of the Dark Age. So the Athenians are focusing on the water. They have um, ships going abroad. They have contacts with the Phoenicians because they are trading in the area. Okay. And they are probably pirates. Oh, okay. But there are also new sanctuaries popping up in Attica. Attica is the area around Athens. And the Athenians have these amazing records of who uh, was ruling in Athens that uh, are probably all made up. But uh, they, they claim to have an archon named Agamestor between 796 and 778 BC. Okay. But if Athens is a small place and Corinth is on the rise, we now have to go to Olympia for the games. All right. Mount Olympus is in the western part of the Peloponnese. It's uh, far west in Greece. It is, uh, the mountain itself is the highest mountain in mainland Greece. And there is a place called Olympia, pretty much at the feet of the mountain. Uh, there has, has, of course, been a lot of digging at Olympia because of the, the fame of the games. And archaeology confirms a date very close to 776 BC for increased activity at the site. So th this date seems very good. Uh, there are two minor city-states called Elis and Pisa close to the, the site of Olympia. And at the start of the games in 776 BC, the city of Elis controls the games. Uh, the origin itself of the games is shrouded in legend. And th there was an, an historian called Posenius who documented a lot of these myths. <clears throat> but he lived under the reign of Marcus Aurelius, the Roman emperor in 160 AD. Oh, that's a so long his research time is, <laughs> Yeah, he probably didn't have too many good sources that we don't have. Right. So uh, I'm not gonna go into these legends too much. Because there are like three different foundation myths for the Olympic Games. And they go back to before the Dark Age. And the Olympics claim to have been already at this point like 500, 600 years old. But there is absolutely no evidence for that. But uh, the, <laughs> the organization of the game itself, the, the reason there, there's a game in this year, 
is attributed to no one less than Lycurgus of Sparta, <laughs> together with two other guys. Do you remember Lycurgus? Yes. Yeah, he's the mythical uh, lawgiver of Sparta. Right. And here he pops up again, <laughs> uh, together with a guy called Iphitos of Elis and Cleisthenes of Pisa. They reinstitute the games this year. Uh, based on a uh, prophecy from the oracle at Delphi, of course. And the oracle claims that uh, uh, the oracle who might not exist in 776 BC then, mm-hmm. uh, claims that people have strayed from the gods, which caused plague and constant war. Restoration of the games would end the plague, usher in a time of peace, and signal a return to a more traditional lifestyle. <laughs> wow, that sounds oddly familiar. I think I think people use that same argument today. <laughs> uh, oh yes, but it seems that the games are founded in religion. They they were very religious, and that the athletic competition itself had a religious purpose, but also that the worldly purpose was to bring peace and harmony and unity, and the games really managed to accomplish this. They are one of the big reasons for the. Sort of the, the Hellene identity of Greece that will lead to the colonization and will lead to Greek greatness. Uh, there will be other pan Hellenic games, and in about in the fifth century BC, there will be a cycle of pan Hellenic games, so that there is at least one pan Hellenic game every year. But the Olympic games are only every fourth year, and this means that the Greeks will use the Olympiad as a foundation for dating stuff. So oh, they will date sense. stuff. Yeah, saying that this happened in the 79th Olympiad. Right. Or something like that. And it's all based on 76, 776 BC then as the starting date. So the, the first 200 years of the games is probably quite different from the later games. Because it's... Um, local to the Peloponnese, local to the area around the mountain. And then it spreads all over. And you can see that in the other Panhellenic games, because they are the Pythian games, and they appear in the 6th century BC, the Nemean games that appear in 573 BC, and the Isthmian games, which, is, uh, con- which are controlled by Corinth. And it's really unclear when they start. But it's probably before the Pythian and the Nemean games, and probably long after 776 BC. So the Olympiad is the oldest by far. So in, in, some of the stuff I will be telling you know, now will come from later dates, and we are just uh, We're lumping them all together. <laughs> yeah, putting them at 776 BC, and, <laughs> but yeah, this this was probably a very small event at. Uh, during the first time. And we know some stuff that was small in 76 BC mm. compared to other things. But the idea was that heralds go out and they travel to every city-state and sort of invite people and also announce that uh, the Olympic truce begins now. Mm. So during the, during the time it would take everybody to travel to uh, Olympia for the games, you could not fight. So there was a truce all over Greece. And this was super serious. So everybody respected this because the athletes could not travel safely to the games. Right. Unless there was this kind of truce. So breaking the Olympian truce is really frowned upon and it will happen later that some states will and they will suffer for it. I can imagine because when you start messing with the biggest entertainment event of people's lives. <laughs> this is something that people, you know, city pride is at stake, you know, family pride, everything is on the line here. And um, I can see how people, I mean, even today <clears throat> um, in uh, College Station, Texas, we have uh, University of Texas. It's the Texas A&M University, excuse me. And this is the, um, agri- it started off as the agricultural college, but they're called Aggies. And 
they treat their football field as if it is sacred ground. And they are not kidding about it. They have people, because sometimes people, you know, storm the fields after a game. Like, if you are not a football player or a you know, member of the team or whatever, you will be um, tackled and assaulted <laughs> to, you know, to take you off the field. They even have their ROTC, which is basically the um, kind of like the pre-army. Like if you're thinking about going into the army, you can join the ROTC and you do the same kind of regimented lifestyle. Okay. Um, and you have you can kind of put that towards your placement. I'm not. I didn't join it, so I, I'm not 200. I'm not 100 percent sure, but they will guard <laughs> the because uh, they'll have their because they will have their saber. They will guard. Okay the football field. And I can only imagine, you know, this kind of, um, game way back in the day, just how important it was to people. If, you know, if you can even use that small town as an example in Texas. Yeah. It's this, this is important. Oh yeah. Uh, and it's, Really based in religion, as I said. So there is a religious festival as much as it is an athletic event. So you will have like religious stuff, athletics, religious stuff, athletics mixed up. Right. But one of the mainstays of the whole thing was that there, there is a, a local variant of Zeus. And uh, he is the reigning duty of the Olympiad. And on the middle day of the games, later when the games are more than one day, but in 776 BC, it's just one day. Uh, later, on the middle day of the games, they would sacrifice 100 oxen to Zeus. And then on the last day of the Olympia, they would uh, they will eat this at a giant party. <laughs> so, uh, the, as this is Mount Olympus as well, it's the mountain on which the Greek gods are supposed to live. Right. You have the main central spot of the worship of Zeus himself in Olympia. And there's a Greek architect, Libon, who mm -hmm. will build a, a shrine to Zeus here. Uh, it's one of the largest Doric temples in Greece. And he will create a, an, a sculptor called Phaedias, will create a statue of Zeus made of gold and <clears throat> ivory, 42 feet tall. Wow. Sitting on a throne in this temple. I think this is a temple that uh, they show in the Disney movie, Hercules. Oh, okay. Uh, and this statue, the statue of Zeus at Olympia, is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Uh, this is not in place in 776 BC, but this shows how important the Olympiad will become. Right. So, the games then. Uh, this is a starting year. The Olympiad will be banned in 393 AD by one of my favorite Roman emperors, Theodosius the Great. Mm -hmm. He is the guy who makes Christianity mandatory oh. <laughs> in Rome. Right. And one of the things he does then is, uh, is two years before his death, he bans the Olympic Games. After then over 1100 years of games every four years so that is why the olympic ends in 393 ad because they are too pagan and they were pretty pagan oh yeah <laughs> if you're following all the rituals so in order to participate in the olympics you had to be a free male greek citizen and you couldn't be too old so they, they were very passionate by youth in this event and um, as it was a celebration to the accomplishment of the human body so my impression is that if you were 30 right you had you couldn't participate so you had to be uh, like 20 ish and uh, if you are a married woman you are not allowed anywhere near the games can't be there work Women, married women in um, the, like the larger Greek cities, essentially confined to the home. 
Definitely in Athens, and yeah. definitely not in Sparta. Right, so, right. Sparta is uh, different. <laughs> uh, so, some of them were, but they were definitely not allowed near the Olympics. And this could be a rule after 720 BC, because something happens in 720 BC, uh, namely that people start to compete nude. <laughs> So they are not nude in 776 BC because there is an incident which um, promotes nudity in the Olympic Games. And we'll talk about that in 720 BC. Okay. Uh, but then uh, married women are definitely banned from watching these hot guys running around naked. <laughs> but if you're an unmarried woman, you are very welcome at the Games. So good place to find a husband probably. <laughs> the whole first Olympic Games is just one day. One day. The whole thing. You travel. And they probably didn't travel that far, but you can see that there, as we do have the list of Olympian victors, some of them come from Sparta pretty early, and Sparta is not that close to Olympia. So uh, people travel quite a long way. Greece is very hard to travel through because of mountains. So people have traveled here for at least weeks. And then they have this event that it's a single day. And then wow. they just go home. And this day was mostly religious. Because there was just one single event of athleticism. And this was the stadium race. So it's a, a, a race where you run. Just and a it's just race. You run 600, yeah, a foot race, 600 feet, 180 meters. And that that's doesn't amazing. take very long, does it? No. <laughs> and then it's over. <laughs> Do you think they ran it in like heats? Like you couldn't have, you know, if there are 80 people there, you couldn't have 80 people running a line, I would assume. I wonder if they uh -huh. ran it like, you know, they did it in they, they, they groups of five, and then the winner of those ran each other, and then in groups of five, you know, that kind of thing. Good question. I I don't know. I don't have the impression of that from this first game, but it seems very reasonable later. Right. Uh, so, of course, there's a lot of stuff going on around the religious things, but it's also a great opportunity for diplomacy, for trade, for discussing, oh, yeah. discussing political things with your enemies, because everybody's under this truce. Exciting at all. So you have this unique opportunity to talk to your enemies and make new alliances. Now you can talk to the guy living in the mountain valley behind your enemy <laughs> <laughs> and ask them, yeah, maybe we should attack the enemy together. Ha uh ha. -huh. There's a lot of artists uh, at the Olympics because they're looking for patrons. Oh, of course. And of course the Olympic peace applies at the Olympic Games, so fighting is frowned upon and you, you have to keep the peace. So this is a perfect place to, to gather and talk to people. And this probably means that the Olympics themselves helped spread the writing because we are very close to reintroducing writing. And we'll spend the whole episode talking about early Greek writing. But it seems that there was no writing in Greece in 776 BC. At least there is no evidence of it. Right. Hmm. Okay, so let's do this foot race. Uh, the, yeah, let's all line up. <laughs> we line up some people. They are young, they are fit, and they are representing their city-state. So this is very important. Heck yeah. and one of the guys representing the nearby town of Elis, remember this minor city-state that controls the Olympic Games. They are the host state. And they, there is a cook called Koroibos, who is from Elis. He's one of the runners for Elis. Maybe he's the only one. We don't know if he's the only runner from Elis. Right. But he wins the race. Yes. And we don't know the name of any <laughs> other competitor. The cook from, the cook from Elis. Yeah, Koroibos the Cook. Koroibos. All right. And Way we remember go. this athletic cook <laughs> 3,000 <laughs> years later. So, yeah. Way to go, Koroibos. Yeah, congratulations. First Olympic gold. <laughs> and this is what he, he wins. He is praised by the people. Oh, yeah. Sounds good. There's a herald that says, 
Koroibos, Kuro- the son of somebody from Elis, has won the Olympics. Wow. And, th- and then there's another guy called Hellanodikis, the Greek judge, who places a palm branch in his hand. So nothing on the head yet. Okay. Uh, but <laughs> And then everybody throws flowers at the winner. All right. And then they tie red ribbons in his hair, and this is the mark of victory. Oh, interesting. So we can safely assume that this was the best day in the life of Kroibos. <laughs> I can imagine. Kroibos, and people would come from, um, <laughs> from nearby places to taste his food. <laughs> right. He takes, the, he takes center stage to thank everybody, gets on the microphone, is like, and everyone here... Gets 20% off your meal when you come down to Koroibo's hut. Yeah. Koroibo's hut. There's, there's probably a place called that in the Elis today. <laughs> Koroibo's hut. Yeah. If, if you've been to Olympia or to Elis, please tell us in the comments what it's like, what it's like today. Yeah. Would you go to an all-you-can-eat buffet in Elis today? I know they considered this site for the 1896 Olympic Games, the first modern Olympic Games, but they just couldn't make it uh, um, serviceable for a a modern competition. Um, The 1896 Olympics was really small and embarrassing if you read about it today, but it happened in Athens because uh, they had to have the, the facilities. Did they have dueling pistols in the 1896 one? No, it was in a later one. Okay. In 1908 in London, they did have dueling <laughs> pistols. It was a one-time thing. They discovered that uh, this was not uh, a good event. <laughs> no, I, I, I would imagine not. <laughs> and I, I actually read a lot about the first five Olympic Games because uh, the fifth Olympic Game in 1912 was in Stockholm. Oh, cool. And it was the first decent one. <laughs> the, the early ones had a lot of weird stuff going on at them. But now we're talking about 776 BC. Yes. So uh, I'm thinking about making a video about the early Olympics because they are so weird. Um, so there was no monetary gain from being the victor of the Olympics, but it was incredibly important politically. So you had the title of Olympic victor f- for your whole life. And as nice. this happens only once every fourth year, there's a handful of people who can title themselves Olympic victors at all times. Uh, there will be more events added and stuff, but this title is super important for you and for your city-state. So the city-states themselves will start to award stuff to their victors. In 600 BC, Athens would pay 500 drachma to a winner, and this is an enormous sum of money. It is enough to last you a lifetime without having to work again. Wow. And when they start the colonization process, very close to this period, bringing an Olympic victor in with your colony is like the, the thing to do. A very few can. And we will see Olympic victors pop up every now and then in the histories. And they will always be important. It's the greatest honor. That's, that's spectacular. And uh, another side note is that there are still no coins in Greece or anywhere in the world. So you don't get the sum of coins. And even in 600 BC, this 500 drachma thing was probably not coins. Uh, I wonder how they denoted it. Like what sort of method? Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll talk about that okay. in uh, the 6th century BC, but uh, not now. We will talk about the Olympics every time they happen. So every fourth year, we will mention the Olympics. And if there were any significant events, they will add uh, other competitions. There will be scandals. There oh, will be winners. scandals. <laughs> yes. So the Olympics will now be a mainstay of this podcast. Awesome. How fitting. And that's uh, what I had from 776 BC and the first Olympics. Wow, that's, that is such a, uh, something, it's, it's kind of funny, we have something that we do still today, 
but it's so shrouded in myth and legend. It's still pretty incredible. Yeah, I think Coroibos would be quite surprised if he had been at, at, at Rio de Janeiro in 2016. Yeah, he would have probably loved the Olympic Village, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he would have been very impressed by the Swedish gold in mountain biking. All right. And uh, some swimming thing. <laughs> right. Oh, just we, we got two. Bit. Oh, you got two gold? Nice. Yes. Very good. Well, cool. Well, it looks like in our next episode, we're going to talk about the most powerful ruler in the world who has fallen. It's the end of the Western Zhou Dynasty. Dun, dun, dun. It will be epic. It will be. All right, don't forget YouTube. Please subscribe, like, and share. Give us a review on iTunes, and we will read them here. So again, let's see. We have, oh, Facebook.com slash Fan of History. We also have Patreon.com slash Fan of History. If you want to keep this going, the best way to do that is to support the show. Again, one of our short-term goals is a new microphone. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, if you want to follow me, I'm at Cerulean Says Hi on Twitter. And Dan, what is your Twitter? Dan Horning. One word. All one word. All right. Well, for this week, I am Brennan. And I'm Dan. And this has been The Fan of History. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash fanofhistory. Just a dollar an episode would help us out. Thanks, and see you next time.